Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? It's Thursday, so I am back for another genealogy chat. And I have Mary Eberly, our DNA expert, with me today. Hey Mary, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you, Lisa? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You said you were warming up a little bit up there where you're at, didn't you? Right, right. And the light looks like it's starting to thaw, but maybe not for another month or so. Yeah. Well, we've had super cold weather and then we had we have 60 today. So it's gorgeous out there though. So, hey, let's see who all is here. Hey, Robert is from California. It's sunny for today, huh? Out in California. Hey, Lily from Southern Mississippi and Flo from Oregon. Hey, Eric, good to see you too. So welcome, welcome guys. I'm so excited that you guys are here. Um, as people are coming in, feel free to, you know, leave a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Mary and I always find it fun to see kind of where people are, are viewing us from. I am in my office in North Carolina where we have a gorgeous day today. And um, I'm really fortunate, guys, because my office, when I research genealogy, I have this beautiful view of the neighborhood out my window because I have this beautiful window, which gets distracting sometimes, but I really love it. So um, I'm pretty fortunate with that. But um, anyway, so if you are just meeting me, if you are finding me here on YouTube or Facebook and for the very first time, again, my name is Lisa Listen. I am the creator of Are You My Cousin blog and website. And over there, I write articles and posts to really take out the overwhelm of your genealogy research. I want to show you how to start finding those ancestors, get over the hurdles, and let's start building those family trees out. And so once a month, I have Mary Eberly from the DNA Hunters joins me for our YouTube Facebook Live because I am not a DNA expert. I know just enough to kind of sort of, kind of, sort of get by and enough to get myself in trouble sometimes with it. But um, so I have Mary come on to ask, to talk about topics and to, of DNA and to answer questions. And so we are going to get to that very shortly. I see more folks popping in over here. Yay, let's see here. How, hey, Danny's from Ohio, good. Hey, Sally from Washington and Vicky's from Florida. Eric, that New York, yes, yes. Hey, Teresa, good to see you again from Kansas. Great. Robert, you have a question. Perfect. I am going to hold, I will ask that just a moment when we get going. Diane's from Ohio. Hey, Marvin, good to see you. And hey, Dave, good to see you from Washington as well. I, okay, so you guys from Ohio and you guys who are the colder weather, you may have heard me tell this story, but I have to share it. So um, my son has moved to Ohio and he was so funny. I said, well, how do you like the snow? Because, you know, we don't get a ton of snow here in North Carolina, but we do get snow, but you know, it's gone pretty quickly. And he says, well, he said, it's fine. He said, but it never, he said, I knew it would snow, but I never thought that about it. Never when it snowed up here, that it never gets above freezing or warm enough to melt it before it snows again. <laughs> so he's like, there's a lot of snow up there apparently. So anyway, um, he's getting used to all of that. So if you today coming in, if you have any questions about DNA and your research, feel free to put them in the comments. I do see them. That's what we are here today. Mary is going to give us um, a really fun Q&A to kind of share with us some of her more popular questions or questions that she gets more frequently. And then we're happy to, she's happy to take questions from you guys as well. So I'll be monitoring that chat as she answers questions. And um, if you don't mind, if you think about it, if you could put like a cue at the beginning of your comment or the word question at the beginning of your comment, it just helps me make sure I don't overlook them and I, I'll be sure to get them. So um, feel, feel free to do that as we go along. I am going to pop in the chat just my link for my upcoming events page. So if you have any questions about when Facebook or YouTube lives or airing, what the topic might be, um, any webinars or things like that that I have coming up. It's all on that upcoming events page. I finally got everything consolidated. So I've put that in there. Feel free to check that out when we're done just to see if there's anything else. And you, again, you can see when the Facebook Lives are or the YouTube Lives are as well as their topics. So let's see here. We have Dee from Wisconsin. Hey, Rosemary from Florida. Yay, love Florida. Hey, Amy from Oregon. We have lots from Oregon today. That is wonderful. All right, let's jump to 
DNA questions. So, um, guys, Mary is, as I said, she is the owner of DNA Hunters. She is a genetic genealogist and she has, I, I want to say has all the answers, but Mary, Mary is my go-to person for DNA questions when I have, when I come up with questions or when you guys ask me DNA questions, I send them to Mary basically because she's the one who has it. So Mary, um, thank you so much for coming today. Again, I love having you every, every week, month. It's fun to have another, another face on the camera with me. <laughs> well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. So I thought it might be fun to go ahead and start as people are getting their questions in there. We have one there, but why don't we start with that? Some of your most, a couple of just your most common questions that you're asked, mm -hmm. and then we'll move into, to those others, if that's all right. So I guess the first one that you get asked a lot is, when it comes to testing DNA, we're used to testing ourselves, I guess. Is is there a benefit to testing our siblings? There's definitely a benefit to testing siblings. And that's because since we only share half of our DNA with our siblings, um, you know, they might have different DNA matches than we have. And this starts to happen beyond the second cousin level. So what that means is that if you have tested somewhere and your sibling has also tested there and your second cousin has tested at the same place then both you and your sib should have that second cousin in your match list and that's true for a first cousin or anybody closer like an aunt or an uncle mm -hmm. but then once you get down to just the third cousin level you start to have some differences in your match list. And of course that um, gets even greater as we go further and further out. So just this week, I heard a story from a friend of mine um, where she had tested her siblings. I think there were five of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of her siblings, I think there were two of them, matched this man that she knew and they lived in the same neighborhood and um but she herself as well as these other siblings did not match him and it was actually his father mm -hmm. so you know when she when she looked at the family trees she could see the common ancestor which was something like the fourth great or fifth great grandparents and you know at that level you're you know you're out there in terms of cousinship mm -hmm. and if she were just going on her own dna she would not have found this connection to this man's father. But because she had tested all of her siblings, she saw this connection that the, the father was in the match list and then she could pull out the trees and figure it out. So, nice. yeah. okay, but this means I need to get my sibling tested now. <laughs> <laughs> right, yep, if you know, and you know, you don't have to necessarily convince all of them uh, personally, my two brothers have tested, but my two sisters have not. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was just like, I don't want to pressure anyone into doing DNA testing. Right. And so I just, I take what I've got and I, you know, I can use my brother's results. One has tested at one company, one's tested at another. And, um, you know, it's really nice to have that. Mm -hmm. well, that actually brings up the second question that you had said you get a lot and i it was you know it's a question i've had and a question i've wondered about too but is it better I, oh, i've got a typo sorry guys is it better to test a male instead of a female when it comes mm -hmm. to doing dna testing right a lot of people ask this question and i think that usually they're thinking about a regular autosomal dna test so that would be the kind of dna that ancestry 23 and me and my heritage test. Mm -hmm. um, family tree DNA also test autosomal DNA, um, but they also do the additional kinds, meaning Y and mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. So if what we're talking about is autosomal DNA, then it doesn't matter. And you know, a lot of times when people ask this question, they say, because the question is on my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. And Again, you know, if we're talking autosomal DNA, then it doesn't matter. But if that question about their father's side of the family 
is through the father's 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 line, mm -hmm. then we can do Y DNA testing of a brother or of a male cousin along that line or your father, you know, or his brother, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone who's on that direct male line. Right. And then we could do Y DNA testing um, at 23andMe, they automatically include that in your test hmm. and they just tell you your, your haplogroup. They don't give you any matches or anything like that, but it gives you a little bit of information. And then if you do a separate Y DNA test at Family Tree DNA, then um, they will give you matches, they'll give you your haplogroup, and they give you a whole bunch of other information about your Y DNA lineage. So, you know, but, you know, sometimes when you push and push to say like, well, who on your father's side are you looking at? Right? Well, mm -hmm. you know, you've got all those other branches, right? Like you're, if it's the father's mother, and that's the, the, the where the question is, then, well, then autosomal DNA will have to do because that Y DNA did not come through the father's mother. Right. And then it doesn't matter whether you're testing male or female at that point. Right. Got it. Well, that's a great, that's a great explanation. Thank you so much for that. All right. We've got a couple questions. Um, Amy asked, and I think this is in reference to your explanation about testing siblings. She said, is it still work workable if the tests are from different companies? So if you're testing your siblings, does it matter? And, and you actually said your siblings have tested at different companies, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, ideally you're in as many places as possible, meaning you've tested or transferred into uh, Ancestry, MyHeritage, Family Tree, and 23andMe. Mm -hmm. And some of those companies let you transfer in and some of them just I'll make you test if you want to know your matches and your results. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends upon what you're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, if, like I was saying, for me, I've got one brother who tested at 23 and me, and he did that way before I was interested in DNA mm -hmm. and um, at least DNA and genealogy, because my, my DNA background goes back more than 30 years. Wow. But um, so that brother tested, he's been very hands off about his test results. Um, so I haven't really bugged him about saying like, well, hey, could you download your results and transfer into these other companies? And so I just let that be. And I'm also in 23andMe and I can see which matches we share. Mm -hmm. I can see which ones are different. Um, and in contrast, my other brother, you know, he was very happy to test at Ancestry, and then he was happy to have me upload to other companies. Okay. So I did that. So I guess it just depends upon how much coverage you want. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, Robert has a question. He says he has a match at 48 Santamor Centimorgans. He knows the father was not, he knows his father was not his birth father, Mother had told him that. How does a, the amount of Cinnamorgans change if he was a full cousin as compared to being only a half cousin? So full cousin versus a half cousin. How would mm -hmm. that change? The well, sure. In general, if you are a half cousin, it would be half as much as if you were a full. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a full cousin let's just say on average, it's 900 centimorgans. And if you are a half, then you would be on average 450 centimorgans. Okay. Uh, you know, and that's a, an instance where those numbers are very different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because with those averages, we also have a range and um, the range of what a full first cousin shares and a half first cousin shares there might be a tiny bit of overlap mm -hmm. between the two, but very small. So, so normally we can distinguish between a half first cousin and a full first cousin. Okay. And he was clarifying. It's not a match for him. It was a match for his wife that has that at 48 
Senator Morgan, and he's trying to figure out. Right. Well, at 48, um, that to me says that it's something like a third cousin. Okay. And at that amount of DNA sharing, those um, the difference between a full third cousin and a half third mm -hmm. cousin there's going to be a, a lot of overlap between those two ranges in terms of how much DNA is shared. Okay. And I wouldn't want to call him a half or a full based solely on the amount of DNA shared. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would look at who are the shared DNA matches with that person. Mm -hmm. And do they go back just on the on the mother's side, you know, like like he's been told that it that he's his father wasn't his biological father, mm -hmm. or you know sometimes you're told that, but it's not true. And then your shared matches would go back beyond that biolog well that father. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I would be able to tell the difference, you know, and be able to say, oh, it looks, you know. There's DNA evidence to support him being a half, whatever cousin, you know, third mm -hmm. cousin, in, likely in this case. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Amy was just following up again. She said, if you upload to various sites, if you upload the DNA, your DNA results to various sites, siblings testing at different companies will still be viable. I would say yes. Um, you know, there's some difference between testing directly at a company. So, for example, if you tested directly at Family Tree DNA, you'll have more um, distant matches mm -hmm. in contrast to uploading, let's say, your, your ancestry results to Family Tree DNA. Okay. Yeah. So there will be differences. I wouldn't... I. If it's around the same time period, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. That makes, that's a good idea. All right, guys. That's all the comments I'm seeing right now in the comments. So we've got some other questions for Mary to answer. But uh, if you do have a question, go ahead and pop it into the comments because I will make sure she, she sees it. So in the meantime, Mary, here's a question. I know you get this one a lot. What if my parent was an adoptee? or unknown birth, pa birth parents. Can I use my own DNA to help find their parent? Mm -hmm. Right, I get this question a lot um, and I help people in this instance. And this is um, where the parent is now deceased and their adult child has done DNA testing to help solve that question that their parent might've had their whole life. Mm -hmm. And very often it is possible to figure out who that, who the parents, biological parents were, you know, so we're looking at an unknown grandparent mm -hmm. and um, the way it works for most people. And I would say it's people of European descent. Um, there mm -hmm. are typically enough matches and enough trees that we're able to figure out who that missing grandparent was. Um, in some instances, I can only narrow it down to a set of brothers, um, just based on who has done DNA testing. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that we, you know, if you if the person wants to know which of the brothers was the birth father, that we might need to ask some of the men's the brother's descendants to test, you know, and that's to see, was this, for example, my mom's biological father or was it her biological uncle, you know? Yeah. And that's, it, it's, it's this interesting um, little puzzle, you know, and to that, the, um, you know, people, people are sometimes surprised to find out, well, you know, if he's dead, you know, she's passed away, her father's going to be passed away. Well, how in the world would we know which is it? Mm -hmm. But of course, the whole, you know, what I just said about, well, if that's 
if that's her father, and if there's somebody still living from that generation, then that person would be her half sibling. And you would share about 1800 centimorgans. And then if it's that person's child, and it's your half, you know, your deceased half sister's child, mm -hmm. well, now it's your half niece or nephew. And on average, you share about 900 centimorgans. Okay. Whereas if it's the, you know, the uncle, then the relationships change and you're sharing less DNA with those people. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Well, thank you. That's, I, I did not know that actually. So, I mean, I, I would, that was not, you actually answered a question. I didn't, wouldn't have, didn't realize all of that was. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have a question Sally's asking from the Facebook page. She said she did a DNA through Ancestry but I'm not very familiar with how to navigate the results. She can see matches that show second or third cousins, but doesn't know how to tell whether the paternal, they are paternal or maternal. So mother or father also not sure oops, if it's okay or worth reaching out to those matches. So she's getting these second or third cousin matches, but she's not necessarily sure whether which line they're on, they're on or, should she even reach out at this point? Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely reach out. Um, but before I did that, I would um, do some research into who that person might be. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have any known matches in your list and this person is a shared match of your known match, well, now you can say, you know, it looks like we're related through, you know, th throw out some surnames, you know, like for me, if it were uh, an unknown second cousin on my dad's side, I would say, um, it looks like we're related through the Eberly or Geib families. Um, you know, do, do you have those in your tree? Mm -hmm. It's also important to build your tree as best you can. So of course, if you're an adoptee and you don't know who your birth parents are, you're not gonna be able to build your tree. But if you if you know some of your parents and, and ancestors, then build it out um, and then attach your DNA to yourself in your tree because ancestry will start to um, suggest how you're related to people. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've got the common ancestors. That's one way. And, um, you know, now you're able to see and identify some of your matches. Um, and both Ancestry and MyHeritage allow you to color coat them. So you've got these colors that you might assign to your mom's side, your dad's side, your grandparents, and so on. Um, so it's just, it, it's it will increase your chances of getting a response um, if you do some of the work, if, yeah. if that's possible. Yes, um, I absolutely agree with that. Um, yeah, because sometimes people will contact me out of the blue and I, I'm perfectly happy. They could be quite distant, but I need something <laughs> to go mm -hmm. on <laughs> type thing. Um, so yeah, Amy said her, and Amy was kind of, a, she's like, yeah, her, her difficulty lies in the fact that most of her matches don't have trees attached. That's a whole nother problem. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Definitely. So, um, okay, we have a couple more questions. So Janice, over on YouTube, is asking, how can she use DNA matches or shared matches of her husband and second cousins of his to find parents of their common great-grandfather? So that's um, looking for a father, looking for her husband's great-great-grandfather. Okay. Um, and hopefully some of those matches have trees and, um, you know, they have, if they have trees, then hopefully, um, they have documents attached to those trees and they're just, they're not just citing other people's trees. Mm -hmm. Um, because as we know, those mistakes in the trees get replicated and, um, that makes it really difficult to, you know, sort things out. So 
it's it's a matter of looking and seeing what those matches have um maybe reaching out to them and say you know i don't know i've been researching this second great grandfather for some time it looks like we might share him you know do you know anything mm -hmm. because maybe they know something even though it's not in their tree and that's a really good point and i know that just from a standpoint of people reaching out to me wanting to know if i know other things so if they've seen something on my tree and they're like oh you know i've got this person do you know anything else i can guarantee you i probably do because you know i do have a lot of things that i still haven't gotten out you know gotten up onto the tree on ancestry so yeah absolutely i think a lot of people do have stuff at home you know mm -hmm. that they might not have on the tree so yeah that's a great great thing to remember right or maybe they have another tree elsewhere you know online or mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. in on the bookshelf yeah yeah amy's actually asking can you upload trees to my heritage instead of having to start all, all over there yeah absolutely you can upload dead comms i actually have a um I actually have a post on that tells you how to do that, Amy. I think I actually have a YouTube video that tells you how to do that. So I'm going to give Mary the next next question, and then I will pop that into the comments for you guys to see. Um, so Danny's asking his wife's, he said, my wife's great grand, no, I'm sorry. Let me start over. My wife's grandfather married a lady, had seven children. She died and he married the sister and had seven more children. Oh, mm -hmm. could I distinguish, but could I distinguish between the descendants of the sisters or is there too little difference? That's a good question. Um, so <laughs> one thing, okay, I'll just start out here. <laughs> um, so it, that kind of, um, the siblings that are produced from those two marriages are three quarter siblings. Mm. So full siblings share two parents, mm -hmm. um, half siblings share one parent and three quarter siblings share, um, the amount of DNA that's shared is halfway between what a full sibling shares and what a half sibling shares. So if this is more recently in time, you know, so let's say this is a, you know, people living today and, mm -hmm. and um, the amount of DNA shared between those three quarter siblings would be, um, let's just say, well, that halfway between the um, half siblings, which is 1800 and mm -hmm. At most DNA testing companies, a full sibling is 2,500. Um, okay. And you're, well, this, I'm going a little bit off into the weeds, but you're also going to have fully identical regions shared with those three quarter siblings. I'll just put that out there um, and keep on going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, you know, right, if, it, if this was something today, I could figure it out. You know whether you know i could see are they three quarter sibs half sibs or full sibs okay yeah. so since this happened further back in time mm -hmm. you know that where we're getting that dna the amount of dna decreased a half at every generation mm -hmm. you could draw out the tree and so normally, grandfather, okay. Normally, um, you know, we, we've got these known amounts of, sh of DNA that we share with these matches. And for uh, a great resource for that is the shared Santa Morgan project tool, mm -hmm. which is part of DNA painter. And you can look and see um, you know, on average, was the average amount of DNA shared for a uh, first cousin or a second cousin? Um, it and it also tells you how much 
you would share with a half. So from that, you could do the math and figure out what would be the three quarter relationship. Um, There's a lot of fractions involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, you know, we have the what are the odds tool, but that does not account for these kinds of relationships. Um, I just put in the link to DNA Painter in the comments, guys, that Mary just mentioned. Okay. So that's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the what are the odds tool? Because you mentioned that we did a whole live on that in the past. And that is good, but it doesn't account, if I if I remember correctly, when you are related in more than one direction. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So and in this case, you you more or less would be. Mm -hmm. um, I I guess, I mean, for uh, an exercise, I think it would be interesting to see, um, you know, to draw it out and to write down how much DNA is shared. And um, I, I'm just thinking there's, there's also those ranges, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but we don't have any published ranges for these three quarter relationships. Yeah. Um, then, and he's clarifying, he's looking at about the third to fifth cousin. So that's quite a ways back. Oh, yeah. Quite a ways I, back. I would say at that point, it it wouldn't be, you mm -hmm. know, in mo in all in virtually all instances. Um, I guess you could look for those fully identical regions on GEDmatch. Mm -hmm. um, it's the GEDmatch one-to-one -one tool. Mm-hmm which which picks up those fully identical regions but yeah i think i think you know because the amount of dna shared you know with the fifth cousin is so small you know and even a fourth or a third and then you've got those ranges i think it would be impossible to find out just based on how much dna is shared yeah yeah that was kind of my thought when i saw that part of it so yeah definitely um let me just double check guys I if you guys have, I think I've got all the questions that were asked. I know we have a couple more that you were talking, you wanted to kind of chat about just a minute. I thought this was, um, oh, so I know this is when you get a lot. Um, and so I thought it'd be helpful. I'm sure folks have this question too, is what are the steps to starting to find an unknown grandparent? Okay. Um, so the steps are uh, include, you know, testing yourself, testing any um, known relatives who also could shed light on that. Mm -hmm. And then basically we're looking at how much DNA is shared with the matches. And in particular, you know, we're looking for matches that are not attributable to known ancestors. You know, so this is where it's important to have your family tree on ancestry to have your DNA attached to it. And, um, and then, you know, being able to identify those known matches, either yourself or ancestry tells you, and you verify it. Um, and now you're left with these unknown matches and you're going to want to see who are the common ancestors to these unknown matches. And are, th are they related to each other? Right. So if if one of your grandparents is unknown, then, um, you know, you might have unknown matches. Just you haven't figured out who they are, but through the shared matches functions, um, you should be able to greatly reduce that pool of unknown matches until you have it, a, you know, fairly good concentration of people who are related through that one unknown grandparent. Mm -hmm. And then by studying the trees, the hope is that you figure out who's the most recent common ancestor to that set of unknown matches. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're building the tree back in time to the, those um, common ancestors. And then we're building the, the trees forward in time to find the, the right person in the right place at the right time. Okay. Yeah. And um, I have the freebie on my website. It's at the bottom of my website 
called um, DNA Roadmap. And that steps through and they it has a picture showing a family tree um, and how you might be able to figure things out based on the matches. And that's a really helpful resource. I did guys just put a link in the comments for you guys to Mary's DNA Roadmap over on her website. And it's a really good resource because I've seen it and I'm, it's a really good resource. So you Thank might you. Like it. All right, let me, um, I, I, we have another question. Let me um, grab that real quick. Okay, so they're asking, is Mary going to be in a virtual Roots Tech 2022 booth where people can ask her additional DNA related questions? And if so, which booth? So um, are you in the virtual in the virtual hall, the virtual expo yeah. hall, basically. I have, at this point, I have not signed up for that. Okay. But this is a good, a good idea. So I will check into that. Stay tuned. Stay <laughs> well, tuned. I'll get back with you on that. <laughs> I have ideas now. All of a sudden, Mary's Mary's going to run. <laughs> I've got ideas. <laughs> All right. Um, guys, go ahead. I'm going to ask her one more question. Go ahead and ask if you have a question, um, and then we'll start to wrap up in just a bit. So I know you get this question, um, Mary, because you've told me this, but mm -hmm. when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I've adopted a baby from another country. Can my child use DNA testing to find her birth parents? What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's normally very, very difficult to do that. Um, because if you just think about who is who has tested at Ancestry and all the other testing companies, mm -hmm. um, it's primarily people from the United States, um, Canada. Australia and New Zealand. And mm -hmm. of course there are people who've tested elsewhere. And um, like my heritage has a huge number of people from Europe who've tested. Mm -hmm. So both Eastern and Western Europe. Um, so that can be a good place if you're looking for matches who live abroad, but just, you know, the, the way we're doing this is we're, you know, testing, we're looking at matches, you know, how close is the match? What is the possible relationship? Well, let me look at their family tree and see how we might be related. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you've uh, adopted a baby, let's say from China uh, or other parts of Asia, I think they will definitely get some really good and interesting ethnicity results back that might, mm -hmm. um, you know, be really interesting to them. And, um, and you'll probably get matches, but it's, they're going to be, in most instances, um, pretty distant matches. But that's not to say that um, that an adoptee would not value that. You know, so right. there are those stories that you hear where you know two Korean adoptees tested and they found each other. So mm -hmm. they they found each other. I'm not sure if they found their birth parents, but um, you know, they both were looking for the same thing, you know, for, for biological relatives. And I, you know, I'm not an adoptee. So, um, but I've worked with enough to know that that can be really, really important. And, mm -hmm. you know, even finding a third cousin that's biological can be really, really useful. Right. And, um, but, but like finding the birth parents, that's going to be really hard in yeah. virtual, you know, I would say, the great majority of the cases, you know, and we, we do have adoptees from Eastern Europe and, you know, sometimes you get closer, you know, like finding mm -hmm. closer cousins. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's much harder. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I always like to um, also talk about African-American adoption and unknown parentage work. Um, I've had success with a couple of cases that I've worked on, but that too is really difficult um, in part mm -hmm. uh, due to slavery and the fact that people weren't enumerated on census, that they you know, were kidnapped from another country and brought here and given different names. And you know, a lot of times we, we need to build those trees back to the like, 1775 in mm -hmm. order to figure out how people connect well, you know, the Civil War was ended in 1865 and, um, you know, it makes it makes that tree building difficult. 
and then what you need is a much closer match. So, um, so, you know, I talk, I talk and I, I don't want to forget the fact that, you know, I can do this work and be successful with my own genealogy and many clients, but it also, you know, we're in a special group. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your questions today, guys. Um, I think I got them. I think I got them all. Um, so yes, head over to Mary's website. You'll find that free, her free DNA roadmap. And like I said, it's a fantastic resource. I think you'll find very helpful. Um, a, I, I like it. I have it printed off and, and keep it close <laughs> when I, when I dabble in my DNA. <laughs> good, good. And it also has information, pretty detailed information about transferring DNA results from one company to another. Yes. Yes. Oh, we got one more question sliding in here. So we're going to go ahead with it. Um, is it realistic to find via DNA matches, the true parentage of a founding left in the year 1720? I have a fourth great grandfather who was supposedly was adopted. I think that would be very difficult. I think so too. Yeah. That would you know, be. if it was colonial USA, mm -hmm. then I think it would still be really hard. It would be super yeah. hard. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to work on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If Mary's so, not gonna work on it. <laughs> okay. That's a good question though. I mean, we tend to think DNA will solve everything and, and it, it, it doesn't, um, especially going quite that far back like that. But anyway, so guys, I will be here next week. We're going to be, I'm actually going to be talking about the 1950 census and coming up because there's some really cool stuff coming around with that. So I'm excited about it and um, we'll be here then. And of course we have Roots Tech coming up. If you've not registered, head over to Roots Tech or is it RoostTech.org? I can I've, blinked out all of a sudden um, and sign up for, for that. It is free. It is completely virtual, hundred percent free. And you definitely want to take advantage of all of that. Super excited about all of that. Definitely. Um, okay. Danny, that's funny. <laughs> he said, this is always a highlight of the month for genu for genealogy, except when the Bengals win the Super Bowl. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so yes. Check out my everything, my upcoming events page for any talks and talks that I have coming up as well. And I will see you next Thursday. Mary, we'll see you next month right here. So have a great day, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.